Hello and welcome. This is going to be a short video on uh, one of the things that was asked in the class. So quotient ocean groups is what we will be uh, trying to discuss here. And uh, I hope this will answer the questions that you had regarding this in the lectures that were already recorded. All right, let me start by sharing screen. And turning myself off. All right, so uh, what we want to do is we will start off with a reminder of what we had earlier. So we remember what a subgroup is. And also I wanted to remind you about this very special sort of subgroup that we call an invariant subgroup. So we'll start off with H, which is going to uh, consist of the elements H1, H2, and so on. So this is going to be a subgroup of H, okay? Now it's not going to be any subgroup, it's going to be a special subgroup. So we'll start off by taking an element G, which is not in H. Um, and then uh, what you can show in a, a short exercise is that the set uh, G inverse H1 G, G inverse H2 G, et cetera, this forms a subgroup. Now, um, what, is, uh, what is an invariant subgroup? If H and G inverse H G are the same for all G, in H, uh, in, in, so all, for all small g in G. So emphasize, I mean, there's special emphasis for all, I mean, elements G of the group G. If this is the case, then H is called an invariant subgroup, or as we all uh, said before, a normal subgroup, okay? And it's denoted by this funny looking uh, triangle that you have out here. Or in other words, um, G, uh, I mean, you know, what, what we said earlier, I mean, if you look at the uh, uh, conjugate of HI, uh, which, which belongs, to, uh, belongs to H, with respect to every element of G, then that is going to remain in H, okay? So G, H, G inverse, uh, so HI takes you to some HJ. So this HI and HJ essentially remain in H. And this happens for all the, uh, I mean, all, all the elements G of, of the big group G. So what, what happens? Similarity transformations that are generated by these group elements of G leave H invariant or unchanged and hence the name, okay? So, uh, so, you know, I mean, essentially the list G inverse H1, G, G inverse H2, G, et cetera, is the same as the list H1, H2, et cetera. Of course, it's not a, I mean, one-to-one -one thing like this, that that's, that's not true, but this, for example, can, can, can go here, right? And, and so on. So the thing to remember is G H I G inverse gets to another element H J, which is also in this subgroup H. Okay, so what are examples? So you remember the alternating group. Uh, this is a group of even uh, permutations of four objects. This has, a, this has an invariant subgroup. So this is actually the invariant subgroup. This is a uh, Z2 cross, uh, I mean, Z2 subgroup. This is an exercise for you guys to check. Um, another exercise for you, uh, you guys to check is that if you take a direct uh, product group, uh, G, which is E cross F, then E and F are actually invariant subgroups. I probably may, may have shown this in the, in the previous lecture, I mean, in, in one of the uh, previous lectures, don't entirely remember. And finally, 
if you look at Z4, which uh, I mean consists of one minus one I and minus I, this has an invariant subgroup, which is Z2, which is just one and uh, I mean one and minus one. So uh, again, this is something that I leave you to, to have a look at. And um, this is something that you should be able to just see straight away. So at the end of the day, invariant subgroups are important things. And what you will see is that invariant subgroups will now help us define, uh, I mean, cosets. And from there, you will define uh, quotient groups. So we start off with H, which is an invariant subgroup of G, written in this uh, language that we have been using. So, I mean, which we have introduced actually. So we will see, as I just said, that um, having this invariant subgroup allows us to form objects that we will call uh, cosets. And uh, with this, we will be able to construct another group, which we will be calling the uh, quotient group, okay? Now for an element, small g, uh, let's consider the set g h1, g h2, and so on, which we will deny, uh, which will denote by g into big H, okay? So now we have a whole, bunch of such states, right? So they, they can be GA into H, GB into H, and so on and so forth. And we can multiply two such sets. This is done by multiplying each group element in the set uh, GAH with every group element of the set GBH. Okay, so let's, let's, let's just do this. Let's see what, what the uh, I mean, resulting set will be. So we start off with GAHI and GBHJ, and we insert an identity here. So GA, GB, GB inverse, HI, GB, HJ. Now we group this, this thing, you know, uh, at, so we group it as GAGB. And then we uh, look at GB inverse HIGB. Remember that when we do this, and given the fact that H is an invariant subgroup, we can always write this as some HL, okay? So this becomes GAGB times HLHA, okay? So where again, as, as we have said that uh, in the third step, we have crucially used the fact that H is an invariant subgroup and hence GB inverse HIGB is some element HL of, of big H. Um, now, since H is a group, the uh, product of HL, HJ is an, an element of, of big H. So what we have is a GA, uh, GAHI, GBHJ. This is going to result in GCHK, where GC is given by GB into GA, and HK is something that depends on GA, GB, HI, and HJ, okay? The objects G into H are these things which are called left uh, cosets. And these, as we have just seen, close under multiplication. You can easily check that these satisfies all other group axioms, and hence the left cosets form a group. So if the group G has an invariant subgroup H, then we can construct another group which consists of the less left cosets GH, okay? This group is known as what we have been, I mean, this is what is the uh, quotient group, and we will write it as Q, which is G mod H, okay? Now, we need to we need to figure out why why it is it is uh, you know the name is what it is. 
So for that, uh, let's let us denote Ng by the number of elements of the group G and NH as the number of elements of the group H. Now remember that you know we what we are doing is for each uh, I mean go set we have you know G A sort of multiplying H right. So each 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 go set G A H can only contain the number of elements that are already there in H. So hence uh, this each go set will also have an H number of of, of elements and. Uh, ultimately, so there can be NQ, which is equal to NG by NH, this number of uh, uh, cosets, because each, I mean, each uh, uh, coset, the number of elements in it is NH. Okay. Now, this is very, I mean, very sort of reminiscent to the number, uh, it is, is uh, very similar and very reminiscent to division that we did. I mean, early in life, maybe, you know, trying, trying to put objects in separate, I mean, separate baskets, this, you know, say, same, you know, if you have, say, uh, four baskets and you have 16 objects and you can put four in each and it's something like this. So this is, this is why, you know, it's sort of reminiscent of all of that. And hence, uh, this is why we give it the, I mean, this has got the name, I mean, quotient group, okay? So the number of elements of Q, which is also called the index of uh, the subgroup uh, H in G is NQ, and this is NG by NH. Of course, I mean, uh, you know, there's nothing sacred of this, this being uh, the le left, left cosets, we could similarly also have right, right cosets, where um, so with with the sets uh, G one A, G two A, you know, uh, given by um, H into G. If H is is a normal subgroup, then then it's it's again a trivial exercise to show that the left and right <laughs> cosets are manifestly the same. Okay. So this was a description of these uh, these groups, uh, these uh, yeah, quotient groups. So the thing that you need to keep in mind is that whenever G has an invariant subgroup H, then we can construct another group from it consisting of only the left, uh, I mean, cosets. This is the group which is called the quotient group, and it's written by Q uh, is equal to G mod H. Okay. So that keeping that in mind, let's let's do let's do an example. Okay. Um, so let's first define what this uh, group is. So we are we are going to define a, a quaternionic group, and we will call that uh, P slash. Uh, so Hamilton uh, actually generalized the notion of the imaginary unit I by adding these two other uh, units to it, which are J and K. And they satisfy the following, uh, I mean, following relations. The, all of these square up to uh, minus one. Uh, J i gives k, uh, and if you interchange them, uh, there's a minus sign. J k gives i, uh, and k i gives j. Again, interchanging. I mean, all of them will will, will have signs. The quaternionic group Q consists of eight elements, and uh, so these are uh, given by, sorry, one minus one, I minus I, J minus J and K minus K. And you can, again, easily prove that this is a group. Now, uh, as, as is obvious, if you take Z4, which is one minus one, I minus I, then this is a subgroup of Q. It can actually be shown that Z4 is, a, is, is an invariant subgroup of Q, okay? This is again, something that I leave for you to do as an exercise. Now, since this is an invariant subgroup, we can construct the ocean group Q of, of this Q slash. So that is going to be Q slash by Z4. Now remember that Q slash has uh, eight elements. Z4 has four elements. So the uh, 
quotient group Q can only have eight over four, you know, that is two elements. So once, once you have a look at it, uh, so what, what are they going to be? So this is the first one has to be said four. So this is, this is the first element. And the second one has is J times Z4. So that gives you J minus J, K and minus K. Uh, you, would be, you would be trying, trying, trying to understand, you know, you, the normal uh, question to ask is what happens if we had not multiplied it by J, but multiplied it by K, but then it's, it's going to give you the same thing again. It's just going to, so it's going to be K minus K, uh, J minus J, which is essentially the same. As, as this, right? So this does not give you a different left cosec. So indeed, uh, so you just just have these two guys, uh, which is which is uh, this and this. And as as you can understand, Q is going to be just Z two. This can actually be checked by explicit <laughs> multiplication, where you multiply these out. You you will find that that you know if you if you sort of uh, uh, have uh, I mean two of this, you'll get 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 back to Z four, and so uh, you know that's that is that is essentially that. So that's going to be, so that's that's an explicit uh, you know uh, explicit way of trying to see what uh, a quotient group is, and um, yeah, so that that was the the example, and so hopefully now this is a little clearer, uh, and uh, again just to re-emphasize re the whole thing once more, the very important thing is uh, invariant subgroups. Uh, the invariant subgroup is, is something where, you know, G inverse, uh, G H, uh, G inverse gets, gets to some, some A J, which is in, uh, in, in H. So, uh, you know, these operations leave the group, leave, leave the subgroup invariant, hence it's called an invariant subgroup. And given this invariant subgroup, you can construct, I mean, uh, cosets. And, and you can see that these uh, cosets will satisfy group axioms, and this will form a group. And, uh, you know, the group that is formed by these, you know, the cosets is, is going to be called the uh, uh, quotient group and is written by G, uh, you know, if G is a group, H is, is the invariant subgroup, then Q is G mod H, okay? And yeah, so that's, that's that. Hopefully that clarifies things somewhat. And yeah, thank you very much. I will stop sharing screen now and end the session. Thank you.